Cup. Right now he's Roba doing Terry Funk in a bionic elbow. Sends him right out of the ring. First thing I want to do is welcome everyone to the special shoot interview with the pride of the USA, Don Kernodal. Uh, he's a wrestler that many fans probably didn't get to see enough of because of the years that he was on top, but he's a true professional in every sense of the word and would like to welcome you, Don, to HighSpots.com. It's a pleasure to be here. Doing this interview. And I guess the best place to start off is your background. Um, when did you become a fan of professional wrestling? Uh, when I was seven years old, I first started watching professional wrestling with my father, and uh, I really liked it. And I told him then that I would, uh, that's what I wanted to do for a living was become a professional wrestler. So uh, when I got in high school in ninth grade, I went out for wrestling and made the team, and I wrestled uh, all four years at Eastern Elements High School. And then when I graduated from there, I went on to Elon College and uh, wrestled four years there. Now, you, you went to Elon College, which is a... Uh, a college is real close to here at Burlington. You grew up in Burlington, Elon, just right beside it. It's a college that's grown tremendously here. You know, it has its own town. You uh, wrestled there four years, and didn't you, you? You were a letterman all four years at college. Is that's that correct? correct? That's correct. And captain of the team as well. On the senior year. So I mean, that's quite an accomplishment. Pretty uh, good. By, now that uh, that amateur experience uh, and your desire to become a professional wrestler, how did you go about? seeking that and who, who did you go to to talk about being a professional? First of all, I'd like to recommend anybody wanting to be a professional wrestler to go ahead and get a great, great amateur background and really work hard on it because professional wrestling is a great business. You can make a lot of money, travel all over the world. And in any business, it's best to get a great background and get a lay of good foundation. So I'd recommend anybody getting the, getting the best amateur background they could. Well, we wrestled at, uh, at uh, Elon my senior year and I started training uh, on top of that, uh, for professional wrestling, it was running like uh, five miles a day, twice a day, and working out with weights, powerlifting, uh, judo. I won the judo's all south judo championship. Um, so uh, when I graduated, we worked out another three or four months to really get in tip top shape, and then I went up to uh, Jim Crockett Promotions in Charlotte. At that time, uh, Jim Crockett Senior had passed, and his uh, son-in-law John Ringley was running the business. So I talked to him uh, on a Monday, and he said, well, I'll put you on TV tomorrow night. So I got to thinking about it, and I just, I just happened to say, well, against who? And he said, against Bob Roop. And I said, well, heck, don't do me any favors. You know, I was thinking more like a, a preliminary wrestler or something, first match wrestler or something like that. And he said, see there, you, you don't want to be a professional wrestler. I'm giving you a match tomorrow night, and you, you don't even want to take it. I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to take it and I'll be there. So I agreed to be there to meet Bob Roop at Raleigh at WREL TV Studios on that, uh, that Tuesday night. So you're, you, this is something that I'm sure most people are going to be, they just unheard of. You, you broke into professional wrestling basically in your first match in a, in a shoot against Bob Roop? That's correct. That's correct. That's astounding. And did, were they aware of your uh, amateur background? They was aware of that I had an amateur background. Uh, they didn't know uh, how good or how bad I was or anything like that, but Bob Roop had beaten everybody in 20 seconds or less. He had he had a deal going on then uh, where he would wrestle uh, people people that would uh, challenge him. He'd wrestle them all over the, I guess, the Mid Atlantic area, and uh, if you could beat him, they'd give you two thousand dollars cash. Well, and, did did you collect two thousand dollars that night? No, I didn't collect two thousand, but I uh, I wrestled him about uh, eight minutes, and uh, he he finally beat me. He's a great wrestler, by the way, um, and um, did really well. The uh, Briscoes was there, O N G Nash was there. A lot of the great wrestlers at that time were there. And uh, later on, uh, I saw Bob Roop when I was doing the movie Paradise Alley, and he came up to me and he said, "If you'd have lasted about ten more seconds, you'd have beat me." So I was pretty proud of that he was a Greco-Roman wrestler, and he, I think he took third in the 1968 Olympics, a bronze medal. Great wrestler from Michigan. So I was just. I was just glad to do as good as I did. See, I think that's something that people would just be, you know, they just to, to think about breaking into pro wrestling that way and then finding out later on Bob Roop admitting to you that you just about had him beat is just incredible. Um, Bob Roop at that time had a, had a shooting hole called a sugar hole. 
he could put you to sleep just like that. And that's what he was doing. He's putting these guys to sleep uh, right in the middle of the ring, like in less than 20 seconds. That's that's great. Now you mentioned Paradise Alley. I was going to bring that up, but since you already did, let's talk about it. How that was in 1978. Sylvester Stallone had a movie, Paradise Alley. How did you get involved in that? It was 1979, actually. Okay. Um, Dory and Terry Funk were good friends of mine, and um, they helped me along the way. And they owned the uh, Amarillo NWA Amarillo territory, and uh, they had wanted me to come out there to wrestle get some experience and train with them a little bit, so I did that. Also, uh, they guaranteed me a trip to Japan, and my first trip to Japan was, was through that. While I was out there, Terry was uh, had been working with Sylvester Stallone in a lot, of, a lot of different ways, doing moves and stuff, and he asked me if I'd like to be in, in, uh, in a movie called Paradise Island, which had wrestling in it. It was basically about Stallone's life growing up in Hell's Kitchen in New York. Uh, there was a bar there called Paradise Alley, and people would come in, and they had a ring set up in the middle of it, and uh, people could challenge the wrestlers to, to wrestle and stuff like that. So I was I was really wanting to be in a movie, so I, I, I did that and it was really a mess alone. Had a really wonderful time, had about a week out in Hollywood and it was really great. So long before The Rock was uh, in Hollywood, Don Carnotto was in Hollywood. And Don Carnotto was there, but he didn't do anything like <laughs> The Rock did. I, I wish I was, uh, could do 10% as good as The Rock did. So. <laughs> now let's, let's go back to your training. You made this impression on everyone you said the Briscoes were there, the Andersons were there. Um, what did they do afterwards as far as they wanted to, to help you become a better professional wrestler? Didn't you train with the Andersons next after That's that? That's right. I had met Owen and Gene in uh, Greensboro Coliseum uh, a few months previous to this, and uh, we had talked, and they knew I wrestled heavyweighted uh, Elon. They had come and watched me wrestle a couple times. And uh, when I wrestled Rupin and came back through the door, uh, they were all unhappy as could be. They were saying, man, you, you did great, you did great, you all. You almost beat him and blah, blah, blah. They, nobody thought I would do that good against him. So Olin and Gene pulled me off to the side and said, uh, uh, we'll train you. said to be at uh, the Charlotte YMCA uh, at Monday morning at 9 o'clock. And Olin and Gene said it would be the hardest thing you've ever done. He said, we won't punch you or break bones, break your bones, but it would be the hardest thing you've ever, you ever done. And they said, if you say I give up or I quit, said so get in your car and go back to Burlington. So that would be it. So I went up there and started that. And, the roughest thing you could ever, ever do. What, ever what did they do? What did they do to you? I know some of these already because you've told me some yeah. fantastic things. But but let the let the people, the viewers, what did the things that Andersons made you do? The first thing we did, uh, we was in the old uh, Charlotte Coliseum, and we went out to the parking lot and ran five miles. It was in I think it was in August, really hot. We ran five miles around the parking lot. Then we did like 500 jumping jacks. And then uh, we came in and run, the, run all up all the steps and the Coliseum up and down, uh, push-ups, sit-ups, everything you could imagine, exhaustion. And uh, then they get you in the ring and you start running the ropes back and forth till you collapse, vomiting maybe seven or eight times. Uh, then they get in the ring, you know, Ole and Gene and uh, a guy named Terry Sawyer, which is a great amateur wrestler from Granby High School. And uh, if you switched them or got away from them, you just had to get right back down. And they, 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 just, they just killed you, man. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Almost inhuman what you had to do. And you would do this when you, when you trained. You said you set the ring up, practice. Then didn't they have an, a show that night? And then afterwards, you, you'd have to take the ring back down to it, right? You set, set the ring up, get, get killed in it. Uh, and then uh, that night, uh, after the show, you'd take it down and go home and soak, uh, go back to the hotel and soak in the bathtub for hours trying to get the pain out of your body. So when you talk about paying dues, people want to talk about paying dues in professional wrestling. That was paying dues when you broke in in I'll the promise 70s. You, if everybody had to get in professional wrestling that way, it wouldn't be near as many people in professional wrestling. That's that's the best way to do it, actually. Now, I, I know I've heard a story that the Andersons was not only impressed with your wrestling skill, but impressed with your um, tenaciousness, that you would do anything to prove that you could be a professional wrestler. And there's something that happened in a in the basketball court in the YMCA that they asked you to do. To just oh, yeah. and, and tell them tell us what they what they asked you to do, and then tell us why that they did what they did. Are you talking about the time they asked me? They were giving me backdrops. They were giving me backdrops on the basketball floor in the YMCA. Uh, that's tough. That's <laughs> about ten of them. Slams, suplexes, everything. But it, and why did they do that on the floor? Um, they knew that I was such a gung-ho wrestler and wanted to do it so bad that anything they asked me to do, uh, I would do it. They were just testing me to see what my 
how bad I really wanted to do it and, and everything. So it was just a test, and they, they pretty well knew that I'd do whatever they asked. I wonder how many wrestlers could say that. <laughs> I'm saying it, but I wouldn't want to repeat it because I'm going to tell you that was tough. Ole and Gene Anderson were some great professional and amateur wrestlers. They were really tough, and uh, they were great trainers, but they they were really rough on you, too. Now, you, you also mentioned another person, um, Terry, that helped train. Terry Sawyer. Yeah. He was from Granby High School. He was a, he was a Virginia State champion probably uh, – Three or four years in a row. So he he's did he he's he the one that spent more time with you as far as developing your technique in the ring. No, it was Owen Gene Anderson. Okay. Owen Gene Anderson. And a guy named Johnny Hydman. I don't know if you remember him or not. Johnny Hydman was a wrestler. Been here. He was from Queens, New York. A tough guy. Um, never about mid card is all he ever got. But one of the, one of the toughest guys you ever seen because he, he was a street person from, from Queens, New York. Uh, but he helped train me in, in the art of professional wrestling. But Olin Gene did the most of it. Now, how long did it take before you actually had your first match in front of the fans? Wow, that was something. Uh, Olin Gene was training me probably for a couple of months, and they said, well, we're going to go on the road. Uh, we're going to go to Norfolk and Richmond and Roanoke, Virginia. I want you to go with us. I said, you, we can train up there in the mornings before, you know, before the shows. So uh, uh, that was fine. I didn't have any, any equipment at all, so we went to Norfolk. And uh, we trained, and then that night they had the matches, and we went over to Richmond and spent the night. And the next night in Richmond, uh, somebody didn't show up. Uh, I forgot why they didn't show up, but they didn't show up. And Owen Gene said, you're wrestling tonight. I said, I, said, I can't wrestle tonight. I don't have any boots. I don't have anything. Well, they got going around, and pretty soon they had me a pair of tights, had me a boots and a jacket. So uh, I wrestled Terry Sawyer that night in, in Richmond. And uh, it was a 20-minute uh, draw and uh, that was really a tough match too because 20 minutes in the ring in front of all the people never had been in front of the people and everything you know you get you all uh, excited and tired out and everything but it, we had a really good match and that's, that was my first one in, in the arena the old arena in uh, Richmond Virginia and and where did that take you once you did that did, did that provide where you get, start getting regular bookings on the cards yes the next week I had a mat TV match with uh, one of the Alaskans Jay um, I had a really good TV match down at WREL TV, and things just started clicking from there. And started wrestling about uh, four times a week um, on TV and in, in, in regular house shows and stuff like that. We started clicking. Just uh, I'd watched wrestling so much, I was like a natural, uh, as well as my brother is. When I broke him in the wrestling business, he was a natural, just boom, 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 boom. So I started having matches almost immediately there. So um, I'm guessing as you wrestled more and more for Crockett, that's where you ran into the Funks. Did you go anywhere before you went to Amarillo? Did you go to Tennessee, or did you go to Amarillo oh, first? I went to Atlanta first. Uh, <clears throat> I was probably just down there for a couple months, nothing, uh, you know, for a long length of time. And then back here, and then uh, I went to Tennessee uh, for Jackie Fargo. Randy Fargo and I was the uh, Southern Tag Team Champions over there. Um, had a good run there uh, in Knoxville in uh, Nashville, and then Memphis, and then Knoxville, and back into Atlanta, and then back here. Now, in the Tennessee, I know that you had a, a situation there where you were wrestling. Was it Dick Steinborn that you had a feud with in Tennessee? That was in the Knoxville area. In Knoxville. And and tell us about there There was a feud that you had going on with him where the match kept in and in a draw and what you did one night. Tell us about that. We uh, we got it. It just happened by chance because we had such competitive matches and and it just clicked, you know, everybody was, uh, he was a master of the sleeper hole, he was wrestling as a gladiator, a mass wrestler, and uh, we just had such competitive matches and everything, and the people just really got into it and started pushing and everything, so we, we started wrestling to like an hour draw and stuff like that. And so finally, uh, we did a deal where uh, we had a uh, hour draw that night, and uh, and I, I just looked at the people and I said, get, just give me five more minutes with him. Just give me five more minutes with him. And everybody was really getting with it and getting with it. So uh, Steinborn got on, the, uh, got on the microphone and he said, there's no way I'll wrestle you for five more minutes. He said, he said I wouldn't wrestle you for five more minutes. I wouldn't care how much money you had. And when, when, when I said, money, is money what you want? I said, let me run to the dressing room. I got plenty of money. All of a sudden, dollars, quarters, fives, twenties start hitting the ring. Hitting in the back like 50 cent quarters, boom, 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 boom. 
His father, the ring, was just full of money. And uh, Steinborn got on his, uh, uh, he got on his hands and knees, started raking it up and uh, put it, sticking it down in his tights. So finally I, I slipped up behind him and threw him in the ropes, put the sleeper on him, put him out completely, got all the money out, and took it up in the dressing room. We had several hundred dollars uh, that night in Knoxville, probably about $300. And uh, we done it in other uh, towns in, in the Knoxville territory. It really turned out really great. It was such a competitive match. And, and Dick Steinborn taught me a lot about professional wrestling. A lot of people, you know, Steinborn's another person that, you know, the people, because of when they wrestled, the, the television wasn't national, uh, a lot of their appearances, so they don't know about Steinborn. But Steinborn was, in, like you said, he was an incredible wrestler. His dad was a top wrestler promoted in Florida. His um, dad was one of the old-time strong men, strong men of, uh, of his time. Back then when you did a squat, the bar was laying on the ground. You had to pick up one side of it, put it up, get up under it, and then do a squat. Milo Steinborn, a very legendary strongman and promoter and professional wrestler. Now, after Tennessee, you held, some, you held the tag team titles there in Tennessee. You came back to Crockett again. How did you end up going to Amarillo? As I said, I'd become friends with the Funks, and uh, they wanted me to come out there, and then we would be uh, training. Uh, I trained some uh, sumo wrestlers out there. Also, uh, they would help me, and I was just trying to get better and better and better uh, on the for the, to be a top wrestler, you know, promos and, and stuff like that. It's a lot of difference between being a say on the first match than, than say, uh, in the main event match. Because back then, in a sense, uh, every all the pressure and all was on the main event wrestlers to actually help make the money and make the checks for the for the guys underneath. So it just it's a it's a process that you go through to try to to learn everything you can. And when you got Dor and Terry Funk offering to bring you into their territory and they're giving you a good salary and, uh, and pay you and teach you at the same time. I mean, it was, it was an opportunity I couldn't, couldn't resist. Plus, uh, like I said, a trip from Japan came up for it, on it and then later on trips from Japan and got to travel uh, all over and do the movie and stuff like that. It's just an opportunity you really couldn't pass up if you wanted. Dor and Terry Funk, they're different styles, but between them they could teach you about anything in the world about professional wrestling because their dad owned the Amarillo territory and then they inherited it from him so they knew all all angles of the business they've been in the wrestling business since they were just kids you know they knew everything about it and they could really help you that was an opportunity you shouldn't pass up right in Terry Funk's book he actually talks about you uh, what an underrated wrestler you were you, that you were a fantastic wrestler but really didn't get the credit that you deserved um, he spoke about what a great tag team that you and Sarge had right. which we'll talk about later but also uh, in Amarillo you talk about going to Japan. What was your experience? Did you have any memorable experiences in Japan, or I mean, did oh yeah, most of my uh, most of my matches in uh, Japan, I wrestled uh, the destroyer, Dick Byers, who's a legend over there. He graduated from Syracuse University. He was a great football player and wrestler there, and he he started over Japan and he, he done got over so well there. He stayed there for most of his career, and he was a, a top wrestler over there at that time. And I wrestled uh, him most of the time. I wrestled Giant Baba. And, had some really super matches over there and some uh, maybe 100,000 people in uh, stadiums and stuff like that over there. But Dick Byers was where I uh, wrestled the most over there. We went all over the country and I was over there for like six weeks. And went back over there another four or five times. It was a good experience. Um, also in Amarillo, I, I think I've heard something about you involved in, in training. You said something about sumo wrestlers. But isn't there another wrestler, the well-known wrestler that you were, you were involved with training out of Amarillo? Um, are you talking about Tonga? Well, him, but then I'm thinking about Tito, too. Tito Santana. That happened in Atlanta. Atlanta, okay. Uh, Tonga uh, was uh, a sumo wrestler from the Isle of Tonga. He was in Japan, and him and a guy named Takashi Shikawa came over from Japan. They were sumo wrestlers, and uh, we trained him in, in professional wrestling. And then Tonga later on became you know, a pretty, pretty good superstar in the uh, WWF. That's his Haku, right? That was, yeah, right. Exactly. So people may not realize, you know, exactly. when you first started over here. Now, when you ended up in Atlanta, how did you end up uh, being involved with Tito Santana? And uh, I was in the office uh, all the times when some somebody would come in and want to break into professional wrestling. They'd always call me down to the office and they'd have to have a shoot shoot with them. So uh, uh, I was in there one day and probably did that 50 times in Atlanta. It's like, you got to come down uh, 9 o'clock Monday morning. We've got a guy coming down. And, 
get him in the ring and mess him up, bust him up, whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I was back in the office and Owen Jean, uh, Owen Jean with the bookers down there. That's another reason I went down there and the business was great. They had a great feud going on with Mr. Russell 1 and 2, selling that everywhere. I mean, it was just a great, great place to go, learn, and plus you made a lot of money then. Short trips, uh, the travel was easy, you know. So uh, I was in the office that day and I, was, I saw this picture laying on the desk and a uh, good looking guy. And uh, I was asked, uh, I knew he wasn't in the territory, and I asked uh, Owen Jen, I said, Who is this guy right here? And uh, he wrestled as Richard Blood at that time, which is Ricky Steamboat's name. Uh, he had started in Atlanta. I mean, he had started in uh, Tampa, Florida. Um, actually, actually uh, Tito was the number one receiver for Tully Blanchard at West Texas State University. Tully was the quarterback, and Tito was the number one receiver. He went on to play professional football. Then after his football career, he got into, got into wrestling. But I said, who is this guy right here? And they said, Richard Blood. And Gene started laughing. <laughs> said, you're going to get to know him really good. So every night I was wrestling him. That's how we, I trained him in the ring during the morning. At night we would we'd hit the circuit. I was wrestling like uh, 30, 40 minutes a night. He's a natural too, great athlete, great guy. And uh, he learned really fast. And he, Jim Barnett really liked him a lot. And he, he, got, he got on top down there. And then he later on, you know, went on. And he had a great career in wrestling. See, you know, these are the things that so many people don't don't know about, which is so interesting. But you know, a lot of times the wrestling fans they uh, compare who's the best wrestler, who's the best tag team, stuff like that. And the Andersons, you know, one of their knocks, and I guess one of the knocks that would be against you too, Don, is that people perceive that you only wrestled in one one territory. But as as we've covered here, is a lot. But the reason why you didn't go, why didn't you wrestle in Portland? Why didn't you wrestle in? in I'll, uh, I quote Ole Anderson on that. Uh, we just talked about that a few months ago. People were asking him why that they didn't consider them to be one of the greatest tag teams in the world, um, and he he gave him a great answer. If you're making, uh, say you're making four hundred thousand dollars a year in the NWA uh, in Charlotte, it's Charlotte territory, Jim Crocker promotion, you're making four hundred thousand dollars a year there, and the people in Portland are making sixty thousand dollars a year. The people over here is making sixty thousand dollars. Why would you leave? They, uh, all the other people wanted to be where Owen Jean were, because at that time uh, that was one of the, one of the best wrestling offices in, in the world. So while if you're making big money here, and you're doing good and you enjoy yourself, I was home here. I mean, I'm a hundred miles away from my home, and, uh, and I made my home in Charlotte after that. So if I'm making great money here and doing good, why do I want to go to somewhere else and maybe make a, a tenth of the money I was making or a fourth of the money I was making? So. Uh, in professional wrestling, remember, it's professional wrestling money, right? So it's not how many matches you win or lose. It's how much money you make at the end of the year. That's, that's, what, that's what is your success. If you never won a match and you had a billion dollars and you won all your matches and you had a million dollars, which one would you rather have? So professional wrestling is the name of the game, and you want to make as much money as quick as you can because you never know when you might get hurt or something. So you want to make your money, invest your money, and, and do really well. So Ole and Gene is one of the greatest tag teams no matter where they were because it would be stupid to leave. That's like if you're over here making a million dollars a year at this corporation and somebody over here offers you 100000 to come over here, I believe you'd be staying over there. So Ole summed it up really well. When you're doing great and you're in the number one wrestling area in the world and you're on top there for years and years and years and years and years, why move? Because everybody else would have gave anything to be where Ole and Gene were and where I were because we, we had a good spot. And, uh, Mr. Crockett liked us, and uh, we worked hard for him, and we helped develop the, the middle of that territory what it was. Um, I mean, that just didn't happen just like that. We were a great product that he was putting on the market, and that's what made it. He, he kept getting great wrestlers and great wrestlers, and the product got better and better and better, and just started growing. Starcade came out of it, the pay-per-views, all that stuff, all the satellite stuff and all that stuff, so it all came out of there. And then the Superstation, I mean, that was a foundation for all that. So. We, we we had a great situation, and I wished I still had it. I'd, I'd still be there today if, if I could. You, you you know, we've talked about all these different territories you're wrestling as you, as you were developing. Eventually, you pretty much settled here in the Mid-Atlantic for Crockett, just like we talked about. It was the better money. It was the easier travel schedule for you, close to home. Um, let's talk about what, what your schedule was like working for Crockett. At, oh, at that time, they, they had like, didn't they have like three crews? You'd run three different three nights, minutes, three different cities in a night. Three towns a night. Uh, a lot of times we would wrestle uh, 
every night of the week on TV. Sometimes we'd wrestle, maybe sometimes we'd do uh, three weeks of TV at a time. So you might wrestle anywhere from three to five times in one large TV taping. Plus, a lot of days we were wrestling uh, twice, like on uh, Saturday and Sunday, we may go to Toronto and wrestle at three o'clock and fly back into Greensboro. And the next day we might fly to uh, Pittsburgh and wrestle. They come back into uh, Charlotte. We were double booked and doing all kinds, a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of no time off. If you was a world champion or a champion back then uh, and you weren't hurt, you, you, uh, you're supposed to go. In fact, if you were hurt, you were supposed to go. 65 stitches in my arm right here. The doctor told me to miss three months, never missed a match, never missed an hour, really. It was going the whole time. Uh, so if, if you was breathing, if you were alive, they expected you to be there and, and to perform and, and to have a great match. And they watched the matches back in and they knew what was going on. If you didn't go out there and work hard and, and perform, well, you'd hear about it. Now you mentioned Toronto. <clears throat> a lot of people here uh, where we are now, which we're in the Carolinas when we're filming this, they, they may not be aware of your success in Toronto, but as my understanding, the town had pretty much died down and Crockett had had purchased the rights to Toronto, or they he had the ability to start running Toronto, and he sent who did he send up to Toronto? Let's see. At that time, I think the Tunnies owned the the wrestling area up in uh, the Toronto area, and uh, it had fallen off or, or whatever. And uh, Crockett struck up a deal with him to send his talent. We had some great talent, like I told you, and uh, a lot of big towns up there: uh, Buffalo, uh, Toronto, uh, all those big towns up in uh, in Canada. So it's a big market for wrestling. If you got a great wrestling show and I'll put that up there, you'll develop into a lot of attendance and everything. So we went up there. They sent Johnny Weaver as the boss up there. And uh, eventually, uh, initially they sent uh, Jim Nelson and myself up there as the Middle Atlantic Tag Team Champions and sent some of the wrestlers that uh, maybe they didn't, give them the, they didn't give them maybe the best talent they had here at that time because they were concentrating on here but also get that started. So we went up there and really, uh, really done really well, and we started uh, really drawing a lot of money and making a lot of money up there. And then all the guys here wanted to come up there. So we, we set the foundation again and got it going. And Johnny, we was a genius. He's a genius in professional wrestling, and um, got it going really good. And and pretty soon it was doing as good uh, like Toronto was doing it as Greensboro, or maybe even better. Charlotte, all the big cities here, we were doing as equal as good up there. So we just actually, everybody started going up there then, and we had we had the huge matches, just just like we did in Greensboro. And we was going up there uh, every other week, so we had uh, basically 24 shows in Toronto a year, doing phenomenal business in the garden and uh, in surrounding areas and the hockey rings and stuff around there. And you you not only held the tag, the, you defended the Mid Atlantic Tag Team titles in Toronto, but didn't you also capture some singles titles while you were in Canada? Yeah, in the process, uh, Sergeant Slaughter and I won the the World uh, Tag Team Championships. We started going up there. I had the World Tag Team Championships. I had the uh, Middle Act Tag Team Champions. I, uh, I won the, uh, the Canadian TV Championship, and Sarge won the Canadian Heavyweight Championship. So we had belts everywhere, man. I mean, it was like you had to have another bag to carry belts in. So uh, we, we were wrestling tag teams up there. We was wrestling singles, and we, we, uh, we really got that area going uh, phenomenal, phenomenal. They had never done that kind of business up there. And uh, it really worked out really, really well. And then I think the WWE later on down the road uh, started promoting those towns. Well, let, let's talk about. Let's go back just a tad. I, I may have jumped the, jumped the gun a little bit. Let's go back a tad. You had always wrestled as a, as a good guy up until a certain point, mm -hmm. and then one night uh, or one Saturday afternoon on television, I'm watching and I see Sergeant Slaughter come out and talk to you. And the next thing I know, you've turned into the bad guy. Everybody hated you. Tell us. How did that happen? Where did that idea come from? You know, uh, he had Jim Nelson as his private at that time. How did tell us the story on that? How did that how did that happen? The uh, the idea came up. Sarge and I got that idea. I met Sarge in Atlanta in 1977, and then um, we'd stayed uh, in contact and everything. And then when he came back in here around 1980, I guess it was, we had talked about doing this for a long time. Because he knew I was from here, and he knew my amateur background, and he knew the people really loved me here because I'd been a good guy all this time. So we were just trying to think of something that had never probably been ever done before. It would be original, and um, just something that would click. And and sometimes when on a baby face, 
uh, gets a chance to turn to be a bad guy. I mean, it just it's how you do it. And in professional wrestling, it's how you do it and the way you do it. So uh, we come up with this idea to do this. And so um, I was wrestling out there that night in a TV show. And uh, Sarge came out and begged me and coaxed me and coaxed me. He said, come on out, come on out. Since I'll make you into a man. I'll make you into a champion. Blah, blah, blah. And so finally, I just left and left my opponent, my opponents and my uh, partner in the ring. and walked off with him. I had a beard and everything. When they saw me again, I had a GI, no beard. I was wearing, I was wearing camouflage, and I was like a private for Sergeant Slaughter. Uh, that's how that came about. Because Sergeant recognized my ability as a, as a amateur wrestler and as a professional wrestler, and we just knew that something like that would click if we got with the right opponents, which became Rick Steamboat and Jay Youngblood, which are the greatest opponents you could ever have. Now, when you when you first started teaming with Jim Nelson, you were the privates, Sergeant Slaughter's privates. You had the <clears> camouflage uh, Cadillac that, that Slaughter had. I mean, y'all really played up right. being you know being part of Sergeant Slaughter's army, um, and you eventually won the Mid Atlantic Tag Team titles. I believe you beat Jay Youngblood and Pork Chop Cash. That's correct. And then you became champions. You defended even defended those belts in Toronto. Um, then it seems like you got programmed in again with Porkchop Cash and Iceman Parsons. What? What? Tell us something about those matches. Um, those were good matches. Uh, those guys are a different style of wrestling. Uh, not my style. I like to do. I like to do a lot of movement, a lot of spots in the ring, and do all kinds of stuff. But they were different guys. Uh, we had some great matches then. Uh, as you know, the black talent draws the black people and you concentrate on uh, areas with, with a black population. So we had some great matches with them and uh, it, was a, it, was, it was good to work with them. But uh, I enjoyed working with Jay and his brother and uh, Jimmy Baggett and, and people like that uh, the most. Now you also you also had uh, Steamboat and Youngblood. I believe they actually won the Mid-Atlantic Tag Team titles in Toronto from, from you and Jim Nelson. That's correct. That's and correct. that was sort of like the foundation for what was getting ready to happen. And tell us what it was, what, it, what that process, that it no longer going to be you and Nelson, it was going to become you and Sergeant Slaughter. That's right. Uh, that was the whole reason for all of it. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Tag Team Championship was just a test for me to see if I could uh, carry the load and, and to, do, uh, to do the right thing and, and to learn everything. See, that was a process, too, of uh, becoming a bad guy in wrestling and boom, and being on top, doing the interviews and all that stuff. But it was a great learning process, and through that, Crockett saw how I was progressing. And so uh, we presented the program to uh, – Sergeant Slaw and I presented the program to uh, Jim Crockett. Uh, now, when you say you presented a program, some, some fans may not really know what that means, but you actually – I want you to tell about it, but I mean, you and Sarge actually came up with the whole idea for this run with Steamboat and Youngblood. Yeah, we uh, we decided we wanted to be the top wrestlers in this area and top in the country. And we wanted to do something really, really good. And to be to be the top wrestler, the greatest wrestler in the in the business, you got to have a great opponent too. In other words, you could be the greatest wrestler in the world, but if your opponent wasn't any good, it's going to make you look bad. You know what I'm saying? So, to be a great professional wrestler. You need to have great opponents so you can showcase each other's talents and everything. So we uh, were wrestling at Myrtle Beach one night, and we said we need to come up with a plan. So we wrote up uh, the whole program, the whole idea between Sergeant Slaughter and Don Cano being world champions against uh, Steamboat Youngblood from the start all the way to the end of the cage matches. A program like that usually ran about six months, but uh, our program got over so well that uh, we went way over a year, and we could have kept on going uh, even longer, but we had an opportunity to go to uh, WWE, so it sort of drew it to a close. But it got over so well. We worked hard, and Steve Young Youngblood is like the greatest, the greatest good guy wrestler in the world. So uh, it really turned out really well, and we had a long, productive, and we had a lot of money, went all over the world with it. And you face Steamboat and Youngblood just about every night when y'all had this feud going for the tag team titles. And uh, matter of fact, Steamboat has said, we, we actually filmed it at a convention. Somebody asked him what his favorite match was, who his favorite opponents were. And most people were expecting, we were in the Northeast, they would say Ricky Steamboat, 
uh, against Randy Savage at WrestleMania three, and he surprised everybody by saying, or maybe a flare match with the, the world title matches. He says Sergeant Slaughter and Don Carnotto. That was his favorite match, the, the big cage match where they won the titles, and that was his favorite opponents. Um, so I mean, that says a whole lot. People don't realize, you know, what a good tag team you are. What, but the development that y'all went into to, to create that program. You said you you actually literally wrote out the program, this feud, where it was going to go. And how did you present that to Crockett? And what did who was booking at the time? What did they think about that? Um, Dory Funk Jr. was booking at the time, but we was fortunate. Uh, we, we booked our own. We, we, we got to run our own program. So we, Crockett gave us the rights to, to run our own program, run our own show, do our own finishes, everything, because uh, he saw the potential in it. And Dory Funk Jr. was, uh, he was very much for it too because he saw it. He was doing a lot of single matches and he needed a, a good tag team, you know, to, to draw money and do things. And it just ballooned into, I mean, it ballooned into something so big. And back to Steamboat, uh, I would have to say Rick, Rick Steamboat is probably the best good guy in the whole, in the business ever. Uh, had the look, he had the body, he's, he's tough as can be. Great amateur wrestler, great professional wrestler. Uh, he could do anything, um, great, great promos. So I'd have to put that right back to Ricky Steamboat. Uh, so right back to you, Ricky Steamboat. The greatest matches I ever had was against Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood and the Sarge. And I had a great partner. I had a great team, a team man to wrestle with, and I also had great opponents. That's that's the ingredients. You got to have everything. You got to have you got to have good bad guys, good good guys. You got to have a referee, everything. The timekeeper takes everything to make a great professional wrestling match. It's, it's, everything's got to click, and and everybody knew their role, and, and and they did a good job. And we had some of the greatest matches, and did some of the greatest business ever. We've done things that'll never be done again in professional wrestling. Well, that's what we're going to talk about next. <clears throat> You, as the feud progressed, uh, there was a lot of twists and turns. Y'all ripped up Jay Youngblood's headdress, and they stole Sergeant Slaughter's hat. And it turned out that Jim Nelson was going to be helping them because he felt ostracized by y'all being the tag team champions. He'd been left out. So he, so this was also part of the plan was to, to have Nelson actually switch sides, and that would eventually, he would actually eventually leave the territory. Um, can you give us some information on that? All that, uh, the head, the headdress, the uh, leg ripping up, everything, the hat, all that was when we when I told you we wrote the program. That was all in that. I mean, that didn't come up as we went. Me tearing my coat up, all that was initially in the in the composition book about this thick we wrote up. I mean, that was done from the very original. I mean, we knew that was going to happen on the right the right time from the very start of it. I mean, that just didn't come up. We we put all that in there to start with. We just we done it in a couple of hours. I mean, we were just thinking, thinking. So all that stuff just didn't happen as we went. It was in the program we wrote up a Rizzy we presented to Crockett, and uh, things just got going so well there. We were selling out all over all over the area, man. It was unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, nobody expected. We, we knew it probably we, we knew it probably do good, but we never expected it to do anything like 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 it did. Um, and I think he was at the Greensboro match. Uh, that's something we can, we can talk a little bit later. We'll go, yeah, we're going to get to that. So, you know, they had this long feud. Eventually it got to a point where the people that did not get to see this, which I'm fortunate enough to do, but got to the point where you you know, you know, and Sarge said, okay, we're never wrestling Steamboat Youngblood again. And it was a big production made out of was going to be one more match. It's going to be inside a cage. But the special stipulation was that if Steamboat and Youngblood did not win the titles, they could no longer be a tag team together anymore. And the match was set for March the 12th, 1983, Greensboro Coliseum. Tell us about that night. I know I'm going to tell my part of it, too, but I, you're, we're, we're paying, to, paying to hear you tell about that night. Tell about that night, what it was like getting there. Getting back to Nelson, by the way, he was involved in the initial thing. We had him in the initial plans where he would, he would turn on us and go, go to them and tell about the COVID clutch train them how to do the cover clutch, how to get out of the cover clutch. That was all the initial plan. We wanted to use Nelson. Uh, at one time, they wanted to, uh, the Crockett's wanted to put him, let him go somewhere else. But we persuaded him that, that, was, that we could use him and uh, to, to, to just make this go on longer and, and be, a, be a, if you think about it, it would be a, it's, it's very smart. 
uh, your ex-partner's mad at you, he's gone, he goes to tell you a bunch of secrets. If you think about it, it only makes sense. It'd be crazy to ship him off somewhere where we can use him to, to progress, you know. So that's what we did. We used him and made him a lot of money along the way. And uh, we progressed it, it, it that way. Um, the things, we just, we just got to clicking with this match. We started out, the, we was wrestling sometimes for an hour draw to start with, and we went into the uh, two out of three fall matches. We went into the uh, strap matches, lumberjack matches. We did any kind of boot camp matches. We, we just kept going and going and going and going. And back then, especially, uh, usually the, the big blow off was like a cage match. Um, like I said, we had no idea this was going as long. In actuality, we'd probably still be going with it if we, if we, if we really wanted to. I mean, that's, it really got over that good, and we could just kept rehashing this, rehashing that, you know. We could probably still be uh, maybe, maybe having a rest of matches against each other. But uh, it just got really unbelievable, and Crockett couldn't believe it. He, could, he just couldn't believe uh, uh, the business we was doing. We was going, we was going to Fayetteville, selling out. Greenville, South Carolina, selling out. Columbia, selling out. Raleigh, selling out. We was going places all over, and everything was like selling out. Towns that used to do like very little money. We were selling out. We were selling out. We were selling out. We were selling out. People were just coming from all over. Tennessee, Florida. Uh, I met uh, Al Snow uh, the first time I ever met him. He came up to me and shook my hand, hugged me, and said, "Man, he said I used to come. He said, I used to drive from Ohio to Charlotte to watch you and Slaughter wrestle." Um, just stuff like that. People were coming from everywhere. Um, if we'd had the TV coverage that they got now, I mean, it's unbelievable what we can do. Because back then, football would preempt you, wrestling shows sometime, um, basketball, you know, it just, it's not, not like it is now. Uh, if we'd had the TV coverage two hours, uh, two hours uh, twice a week and stuff like that, it'd be, it'd be phenomenal. But it just started snowballing then. Things were just going, everything we did was big. I mean, just boom, 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 boom. People was right in the office saying, man, this view with Steamboat, Young Buck, and all Slaughter is just the best thing I've ever seen, blah, blah, blah. They respected Sergeant Slaughter and my talent as a, as a wrestler. Uh, we were bad guys, but we didn't do the, the eye gouging maybe too much or the head, hair pulling and stuff like that. They respected our ability as tough, tough wrestling guys, tough, tough bad guys, sort of like old and Gene, stuff like that. So they knew we could wrestle, and they knew we were tough, and they knew we'd do anything to win, basically, we had to. Um, so it really started snowballing, man. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and everybody's going, like, man, this is unbelievable. And so eventually um, it, it came to the culmination because when you were going to New York, we got offered a great deal to go to New York. And so it became the cage match in, uh, in Greensboro. And uh, that night, uh, I was riding with Ric Flair, and uh, Sarge, uh, something had come up, Sarge had to do something before he came. So uh, Flair and I were getting off at 85 on the other side of Greensboro, on the Charlotte side of Greensboro, and man, on the 85, tra Interstate 85 traffic was backed up. I was going, man, what the heck's going on here? And I looked at Flair and I said, I don't know what's going on, but I said, I hope, I hope they go into the wrestling match. And man, that's what exactly what it was. They was coming in from everywhere, everywhere. Uh, we got there, and it, I mean, we could hardly even get up in there. And the cops were on the radio saying, if you don't have a ticket, turn back, turn back, turn back, turn back. Sarge had to park his car a mile from the uh, from Greensboro Coliseum and walk walk into the Coliseum. Um, it was just amazing. And the cops told us that they've had uh, ACC basketball tournaments, they've had everything in the Greensboro Coliseum. They said they'd never seen anything like it. And they told us that they turned away 20,000 people. I think you were there. That I, I was going to say, you know, for people that think that wrestlers blow up the stories and and, and – make it sound bigger than it really is. I was there that night. I bought a ticket. I used to go because I, I love to see Slaughter and Cronos and Steve Buckingham. It was great. Every, every time they were there, it was great matches. The match was so big that the semi-main event that night was Ric Flair versus Greg Valentine for the NWA world title. So your tag team match was main event and over Ric Flair as the world champion. We pulled up there. We couldn't get in the parking lot either. Had to park uh, basically on top of, right beside the railroad tracks. So our car was probably going to get hit by a train if it came through, it was that close to railroad tracks. And I was offered $50 for my ticket for somebody to drive from West Virginia to come down there. And the police, like you said, if you didn't hold up your ticket, they'd kick you off the, the ground. You couldn't even get close to the building. And when you talk about a traffic jam, that was exactly what, everybody was there to see that match in Greensboro Coliseum. It had never been done before and it was, it was great. Um, 
I met a guy in, uh, 20 years later here in Burlington, works at the bank, his name was Doug, and he saw me and he said, Don Cronow, Don Cronow, man, and he came out, come out and he wanted to meet me. He reached in his wallet and he pulled out a ticket for that very match. He carried it in his wallet and said, it said uh, 1983, Slaughter Cronow, Versus Steamboat Youngwood, he said match. He had written on a match, match of the year. So uh, that was that was pretty amazing. But not only did we do that in Greensboro, but after that, we we went all over. We stayed. We decided to stay maybe another uh, uh, four months, and we done that in Fayetteville. We did it in Greenville. We went to Fayetteville one Sunday one Sunday afternoon, and it, it, we got there an hour late. It was traffic was backed up everywhere. I mean, we didn't in Richmond, Virginia. We North. We done that all over. And uh, it was especially uh, great in Greensboro because 20 miles from Greensboro where I was born and raised and, I, and I'd always went to wrestling in the Greensboro Coliseum and to go to that close to your hometown and do that kind of business and everything, it was, it was amazing. And uh, to this day, I, I get goosebumps talking about it because it, it was amazing. And I'm glad you were there, by the way. Um, but we did that all over. The building in Greensboro is just larger, uh, so we did more, more money there. But, uh, We'd probably done that at least uh, 25 or 30. And uh, we also come up with another plan after that where we sort of got the belts back and we, 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 we'd done some super business there before we left to go to, go to New York. Yeah, when you eventually, the time came for you to go to New York, you had that deal and y'all did a series of rematches with the stipulations reversed. Right. You're in the cage and this time if you didn't win, you and Sergeant Slaughter could no longer be a tag team. And That's then right. that was, then you went to New York. So tell us about what happened going to New York. Uh, we had a great opportunity to, to go to New York, uh, not as a tag team, but as individual wrestlers. So, Sarge had been in New York before, uh, and back then, uh, the Great Hills would go in and wrestle like Bob Beckman, the champion, for X amount of time, and then they'd come back out. And uh, Before Sarge went up there, uh, Ivan Koloff was up there. And uh, Sarge and I had always had an idea for a us to be good guys someday, and uh, Sergeant Slaughter in the Pride of the USA wrestling the Russians. So we always had that in the back of our minds. See? So we go up to New York, and Sarge has a great run with uh, with Backlund, and I was wrestling uh, two dollars matches like that. I was like in mid card matches, uh, making some serious money. What it, it takes time back then, it took time to to work yourself up on top. Vince uh, Senior would watch you. And it may take a year or two before you really got an opportunity. You had great wrestlers up there, but it, you just had to work your way up to get to that, you know, that, that slot because it had so many great, great wrestlers in town up there. And uh, so I was working my way, you know, up and doing really good wrestling. Jimmy Snuka, some, and have Don Morocco having having great matches and everything. Well, anyway, uh, I guess about after eight or nine months, uh, Ivan and I were talking about. Uh, maybe setting the foundation to come back down here to uh, to bring in a, a, a nephew or something for him as a Russian wrestler and for Ivan and I to come back as world tag team champions and then bring the nephew uh, in and break him in uh, who later became Nikita Koloff. Nikita Koloff was, was, was my my idea, my, my uh, character I created in wrestling, if you will. Um, so as Sarge was up there, and knowing he was going to be there for probably a few, maybe six more months, we called, uh, actually flew down and talked to Jim Crockett about coming down, and uh, Ivan and I becoming uh, world tag team champions. And then we would get Nikita and bring him along, and then when the time was right, uh, come back, uh, and Sarge Slaughter and Don Cano, uh be against the Russians. I gave Ivan an American flag, he gave me a Russian flag, and. and we had it really set up really good to do that. And this was this was actually at a point when the U.S. and, and the Soviet Union were having a lot of problems. We had boycotted the Olympics being held in uh, in Russia, and Russia had boycotted uh, the, some games that we had in, in Atlanta, I believe, at the time. It was, yeah. that was but the, it wasn't idea. the Olympics, but it was like the Pan Am games or something. That was the whole idea. We'd, uh, we'd get uh, Nikita. Uh, I was nephew to call us and say he was mad because he couldn't compete in the Olympics in weightlifting and wrestling, and he was mad and he wanted if uh, his uncle Ivan and I would train him to be a professional wrestler so he could be a world champion in professional wrestling since he couldn't be a, a world champion in the Olympics. So we, that's how we created Nikita and brought him in. And as you know, he got over uh, like a million dollars. Nikita, Nikita actually credits you. 
uh, on camera in, a, in his shoot interview, you know, that you were responsible for uh, Nikita Koloff being what he was, that you helped develop him. And that's, that's correct. Um, Nikita was a big guy, a uh, road warrior uh, animal, actually helped me find him. He was uh, from Minnesota and went to college with an animal, and they were friends, and uh, that's, that's how I found him. In two days, he was in the, in the office, head shaved, ready to roll, about 285. You know, he looked and everything. And, uh, Nikita didn't have a wrestling background at all. He was an All-American football player. Uh, no, no background at all. Never been on a mat, never been in the ring, ever, ever. Dorton Arena the night, first night he, we did our interviews and everything, he was there with a the chain around his neck. He had to wrestle that night. He never been in the ring before. I took him in the dressing room and told him what to do, just like that. He never been in the ring before on a wrestling mat, amateur or nothing. And he went in there and got an 11 second win. We wanted to build a superpower because Ivan and I, smaller guys, could do the wrestling part. But we, like, Sarge was a real big guy and, and Nikita a big guy. We won't have two big guys and two guys like Ivan. So we, we created a superpower. And to this day, uh, Nikita's an evangelist now. He goes to churches, and people are mad when they find out he's not really a Russian. They really think he's a Russian. And then when he tells them, and he's not, they still, they get, still get mad. He done that so well, they really believed he was from Russia. He actually got books and learned Russian, and, and he, did his, he did his part. I mean, he was that 100%. He didn't do it like just in the ring or the hotel. He was, he did that part 100% all the time, and it got over really, really well. Now, when you were tag champs with Ivan, um, what, I mean, where, where would you rate the, the scale of the fan reaction to that as opposed to when you were with Slaughter? Uh, we Not asking for the, you know, what did, how did the fans react? What kind of reaction? We did really, really well. The fans were really uh, hot at me for joining up with, uh, uh, with the Russian, giving them the flag and everything. They were really hot at me. But to be honest with you, there would never be another comparison to, to Sergeant Slaughter and myself for me because – uh, at that time, Sarge was a big guy, and he was like a superhero. I mean, he was just a, one of the biggest and baddest wrestlers in, 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 of his time, you know. Um, so it, it's, uh, that would be the best, Sarge and Slaughter, myself. But Ivan and I were, were really good, and um, we, we got a lot of heat. I mean, we had a lot of heat. We were, we were selling out a lot of places, too. And uh, that, that program didn't quite go as the way, way we planned it. Uh, but if it had it, we would have we would have done even better. But I was a great partner, a great man, Nikita too, and we we did really really well. And but number one would be Sergeant Slaughter myself, and then Ivan and myself. Well, that was what I was going to ask you too. When you talked about the program that you developed with Sarge, when you when you came in with Ivan and met with Crockett about the program for that, how uh, you you had it all planned out about how the Russians would eventually turn on you, and and then you was going to fight. You mentioned bringing Sarge back in, and you did actually bring Sarge back in for one match in Greensboro. Yeah. And but it didn't quite go the way he was playing. Why don't you tell us what what, what happened? actually there? happened on that was um, Sarge actually got an opportunity to stay in New York um, longer, and actually he's never really came back here on a full time basis. He's actually been with the WWE practically ever since. Um, just things changed when Vince uh, Jr. took over. Uh, now the guys they don't do like they used to, like his dad used to do. Uh, you might be up there wrestling for 20 years now. You know what I'm saying? Back then, the top guys would, would go in and wrestle the champion for a year at max, and they, then they'd, they'd come out and somebody else would go. But uh, we got to come. We've done, we've done several matches. Uh, you saw the one in Greensboro. We've done several of them uh, around the area uh, that you didn't see uh, around the middle of the area. But we've probably done a total of maybe 50, and they've done record break sellout business. But like I said, Sarge, uh, Sarge didn't. Uh, Get to actually come back in this, though he didn't. He chose not to come back in this area, and uh, as it is, it worked out good for him because he's in the WWE now, and Jim Crockett Promotions is no longer. So he he did a good move. I, I should have stayed up there myself. It'd been a lot better for me. I'd still be up there right now, but I chose to, to do that. And you know, I guess everything works out for the best. But uh, I'd been a lot better off if I'd have stayed with Vince uh, myself and uh, still be up there. Okay, Don, you fighting Nikita and Ivan. They had turned on you. You seen the light. We tell us about what was supposed to happen, but but something happened in, in yeah. inside Jim Crockett Promotions that, right. that didn't didn't happen. Actually, what happened 
the biggest the biggest thing that happened was Sarge decided to stay with w, w, uh, WWF at that time, which was the right thing for him to do. He's still working up there today at the WWE. Uh, but uh, the, they changed uh, management to get uh, Jim Crock promotions. And uh, I got to wrestle with like Steamboat and some other different partners against the Russians. Uh, they would give me Magnum TA, Steamboat, um, maybe Jay. I mean, it was just a, a mirage of things, a uh, bar barrage of things, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and there was a set opponent or a set program. But the original was Sergeant Slaughter against the Russians, and due to the changing of the management of Jim Crock Promotions and Sarge decided to stay with the WWE, which was the right move, Sarge. Um, it didn't quite happen the way we wanted to, but SARS did come down maybe on about 50 different occasions in different towns, and we had some rematches. Um, and I did, uh, in, in Greensboro, Magnum TA, myself, and Sergeant Slaughter was against Ivan and Nikita and... Uh, Crusher. Crusher Crucial. And uh, we did win the American flag back in Greensboro. Now, speaking of Crusher Khrushchev, uh, I think you got an interesting story about Crusher and how he hurt his knee. Right, right before that, uh, I've got it on tape. <laughs> you did like a triple backdrop. He landed on the ropes. He blames you for his knee getting hurt. Exactly. I'm sorry. Exactly. We uh, we did a triple backdrop where uh, all three of us wrestlers backdropped at the same time, and I backdropped him, and he said he hit his leg on the rope or something like that and hurt his knee, which didn't matter to me because me and him were not friends anyway. So he hurt his own self. I didn't hurt him at all. Now, uh, the big cage match that we talked about with Slaughter and Cronodo, Steamboat Young, but the success of that, a lot of people credit that event with the creation of Starcade, which came on after that. Now, when the first Starcade happened, you were actually in New York at that time. But when, the, when they came back again in 84, um, this was during the Ivan Nikita feud, but you didn't actually wrestle. You supposedly had been injured by the Russians, and your brother teamed with Ole Anderson against Ivan and Nikita. Do you remember that Starcade? That's correct. That was a great Starcade, by the way. Um, <clears throat> it was, uh, myself was hurt with a hurt neck, and um, they asked me who I would like to get to wrestle uh, uh, Ivan and Nikita. And I came up with the idea of my brother and uh, Ole Anderson, since Ole had trained me, and I knew he would really work hard and uh, beat the Russians really good for me. So it was, uh, Ivan Nikita against my brother, uh, Rocky Cronodal, and uh, Ole Anderson in the Greensburg Coliseum. And we went out there, and I was on crutches. And uh, they had a great match. I don't know if you remember or not, but it stole the show, actually, because everybody was standing up with their lighters. And we played uh, Neil Diamond's uh, Born in America or something like that. Uh, and they had it all up on the, the show, up on the light show, up on the, the top of the building. It was really great. Uh, and Wally and, uh, excuse me, Rocky and uh, Ole went in there and had a great, great match. And then we had a finish where I got involved with the, with the crutches and broke the crutches over the, their heads and beat them down pretty good. But I took a big clothesline out on the floor myself from Nikita. Uh, and that was, a, that was a great match and a great ending. And we, we went around the, the area again doing those matches all over also. Now, you speak about your brother. He basically... Uh, he had began. He had began wrestling as another name prior to becoming Rocky Cronodal, You know, right. re revealing his real identity. But you actually helped get Rocky into wrestling. Could you tell us any of that? Um, I guess in late 1979, early 80, um, Rick Flair and Black Jack Mulligan uh, purchased the uh, Knoxville uh, territory, the NWA territory, and I had an opportunity to go there as a Super Destroyer along with uh, Steve Muslin, wrestled the Super Destroyer tag team. And uh, as, as we all know in professional wrestling, you try different things and grow. And that was an opportunity for me for, to be a mass wrestler, to go to be on top, at a manager, uh, to learn how to do interviews. It was just a stepping stone uh, in professional wrestling. In professional wrestling, you, you want to try different things. Uh, you know, it may not know what your niche, your niche is, and you just try different things until you really hit on something. And so uh, I went as a super destroyer. And my brother, we didn't want to use the name Rocky Cronulla, so we came up with the name Keith Larson for him to wrestle. Uh, so he went over there and started in uh, 1980, and uh, he, he was a natural. He, he was a great wrestler, great amateur wrestler. 
very strong bench pressing about 425 to 200 pounds. Uh, and he became a good wrestler, and we, we wrestled over there for a while. And then when uh, I got a chance to come back here uh, to uh, Jim Crock Promotions, and Sergeant Slaughter came in a few months later, and that's when we came up with the idea of uh, Slaughter and Canova wrestling the Steamboat and Youngblood. All right. Um, now, after after that Starcade 84, we started going into 85. You actually wrestled at Starcade 85 against Tommy Lane. And that was the year they did the split show where they had half Starcade in Greensboro, half in Atlanta. But, um, you know, we definitely at that period, you know, the feud with Ivan and Nikita had changed and right. was focusing against uh, right. other people. And, and your your spot has sort of sort of been knocked down by who was running the company at that time. That was actually, if I'm correct, it was my brother and I against Tommy Lane and Nelson Royal in a tag team match at Starcade. I've got 86 with you tagging with Rocky against Tim Horner and Nelson Royal. Okay. And I may be wrong. I just was what information I pulled off the internet on that. Okay. 85 is, is a singles match. But it may have been a tag. Because I'm thinking it was a tag match too. I'm thinking it was. Uh, I'm thinking that's what it was, but I'm not for sure. But your role started changing in Crockett Promotions. It was. Promotions. The management came in. As I told you before, we were running our own deal. Uh, we were our own uh, bookers and bosses um, on that uh, Steamboat Youngman thing. Sorry to call it and as the new management came in, uh, which was Dusty Rhodes, um, he went in a new direction with Ivan Nikita. Um, he brought in the Rock and Roll Express, and they were wrestling Ivan Nikita. And then later, not a, not a lot later, uh, wound up teaming up himself with uh, Nikita and Ivan, and they became uh, good guys in wrestling. And uh, I don't think they ever. I don't think the, Ivan Nikita ever wrestled for the NWA again as, as bad guys. I think they were good guys the rest of the time. So Dusty went with the Rock and Roll Express instead of myself and my brother, and also uh, he and different opponents, including Ivan Nikita, was wrestling guys. So he went with a, di a different direction. Well, a lot of people have said that you know Dusty pretty much had guys that he knew and he wanted, and that's he brought them into the territory rather than using a lot of the. The ones they were had, but <clears throat> I know there was a story that that I'd love for you to talk about a night in South Carolina. You're supposed to wrestle Buddy Landale, and uh, right. right. Uh, getting back to Dusty and, and, and any Booker for that matter. Uh, sometimes uh, when a Booker came in from other areas, he would bring his talent with him. That that not only was Dusty, but that was a lot of talent. Say say you were a Booker in California and you'd done really really well, and you came into a new area and you had some proven talent you know that could do the job and, and, and make a lot of money, you might would bring them in um, as new talent. Also, sometimes talent stayed too long in one area, and uh, it might be a, a good idea to, uh, to bring new talent in. A perfect example was, uh, I don't know if you remember, when George Scott took over the booking job here, he brought in uh, Johnny Valentine, Wahoo, uh, he brought in uh, Don Jardine, Super Destroyer, he brought in some new talent. It takes a long time to really get it going and to make it make it start happening, but in the end, it worked pretty good. So, um, not only Dusty, but a lot of bookers back then would bring in their talent when they when they came from different areas. Um, and getting back to the, the deal in South Carolina, I was asked to uh, to let Brother Landell beat me in uh, Sumter, South Carolina, and I refused. I refused to do it, and I had a choice either to do it or to to take my tights off and not wrestle, so I, I didn't wrestle that night. And I met with Jim Crockett Promotions and Jim Jim Crockett the very next day, and uh, I got everything straightened out. But uh, that was uh, JJ Dillon's idea and, and Dusty's idea, and I refused to do it. But it was it was actually quite funny because I was with you when Buddy came up talked to you at one of the Legends conventions, and and he at the time he might not have been happy about it, but he was. He was pretty. It was pretty funny to him at the, you know today looking back at it. Well, Buddy Landell knows not to mess with me, <laughs> whether it be in the ring or whatever. But I, I like Buddy Landell. Uh, he's fine. He did put me over to his show, by the way, didn't he? Yes, he on, did. On the radio and about my old girlfriends and everything. But anyway, uh, Buddy Landell's fine. At that time in my career, I didn't think it was the right thing for me to do, so I refused to do it. Nothing against Buddy Landell. He's a great talent, great wrestler. But it, I was, I did what I thought was right for me, and that's. I stand by today. Well, what brought about the exit from Jim Crockett Promotions? Well, as I said, uh, it just getting it just kept 
uh, in my mind, getting worse and worse. Uh, things weren't going the way it should be, and the new management and uh, business was really getting bad. I mean, uh, business was good for a while, and it just got worse and worse and worse, and things were getting chaotic, and people weren't getting along, and arguing all the time with the bookers and, and the office and everything. And So finally, I just had enough of it, and I'd done real well in wrestling and made some good investments, and I was doing all right financially, so I just had all of it I wanted, and, and I didn't like the way it was going. And so I said I'd rather go out. I'd rather go out as a champion, or people knowing how I was, than to stay. Uh, I was wasn't the youngest guy in the business. I was getting older, and I decided I'd just go ahead and retire, and get out of the business rather than be brought down, you know, and to nothing. And eventually, uh, Jim Crock Promotions went bankrupt through that management, and. Uh, Ted Turner wound up buying uh, Crockett out and starting the WCW. Let's um, let's talk about if you if you don't mind, let's talk about some of the some unique experiences that you had in professional wrestling. You've told me all kinds of tremendous stories in the past, and uh, you know one that sticks out in my mind a lot is wrestling in Puerto Rico and what it was like in front of those fans and what those fans actually would do to you know an American bad guy that came to Puerto Rico. First of all, getting back to what you asked me just before, in my mind when I started wrestling, I was 23 years old, and in my mind I had, I was going to retire at 40, and I was right there at the 40 mark, and so I, I had really set up uh, my retirement plans and all that stuff, and things weren't going good, so I decided I'd just go ahead, go ahead and retire there at that 40. But yeah, wrestling in Puerto Rico was great, um, right there on the beach, uh, uh, Carlos Colon ran that area. Uh, had some good talent over there, and we had some great matches. My brother lived over there for two different times. I just went over and wrestled a, uh, a week here and a week there. But uh, we uh, we wrestled, uh, had some great matches over there. You might be talking about Guatemala. I'm talking about the one where they, they were messing with you in the locker room, and they ended up they, they, they ended up throwing a little package in there for you? In yeah, a bag? Yeah. Something in a bag? I'm going to stop that again because I don't know. We, we can keep going. But, uh, now, what are you talking about? The the fans, you know, they would throw objects at you, and you were in the locker room, and, and they were messing with you at the window, and eventually you, like, slammed the door window on them, and they, they quit for a while. You threw, threw something out, and next thing you know, something busted through the window, and it was a bag, and it was a snake inside of it. A snake inside of it. I didn't dream that one. And the fans threw a, a snake into the locker room at, at one of the stadiums. I think that was in Guatemala. Well, it may have been Guatemala. Not Puerto Rico. He knows more stories than <laughs> I know. We didn't mess the whole tape of that one. No, it's okay. Uh, I wrestled in Guatemala. In 1975, Tony Atlas, Larry Zabisco, and a few of us went over to Guatemala to wrestle. And uh, it was snowing here. We went over to Guatemala. It's about 100 degrees over there. We wrestled there for a week. And uh, we left on a Monday night at 6 o'clock, 6 p.m., and we wrestled in Guatemala City every night over there. And the next morning at uh, 2 a.m., an uh, earthquake hit over there in Guatemala City and killed 23,000 people. So we left just a few hours before the, before the earthquake hit over there. What other kind of, you know, if you got any other kind of experiences you can tell us, just, I mean, you've had run-ins with different wrestlers in the, in the locker room, uh, the thing about like Ken Patera, anything? Yeah. Um, most wrestlers uh, never bothered me too much, uh, but uh, I've had a few like run in with uh, Ken Vitera, uh over a magazine, believe it or not. Uh, and he got the message real quick and he left the building down WREL TV. Uh, we since have uh, gotten back okay, but uh, Ken Vitera, I put him out of the building, for lack of a better way to say it. Had a few uh, calls over Sari. Uh, uh, Angelo Mosca uh, had trouble with a few professional wrestlers, which you will in any business. But most, most of all the time, uh, I didn't have a lot of wrestlers to mess with me because the word was out that I, I would might would jump on somebody. You never know about me. Well, uh, what what other wrestlers did you travel with, or did you spend a lot of time with besides oh, wow. Sarge and Ivan? 
I spent a lot of time with uh, Nature Boy Ric Flair. Uh, that was a, that was amazing right there. That could be a book right there. Mm-hmm. Well, we've heard quite a few uh, interesting <laughs> stories when it comes I to the Nature Boy. Rick Flair. See, Rick Flair came in here, I believe, it was in nineteen seventy four or five. Um, came in from Minnesota. He weighed about two hundred eighty five pounds. Big guy. Uh, they saw his uh, his talent and they put teamed him up with Rip Hawk and you know he started working on top and he lost his weight and blah blah blah. Became a probably one of the greatest wrestlers ever in the business. I think Flair's one of the greatest. He's been on top for, what, 40 years, still going strong. And I was on the I was on the card that night in Wilmington that the big plane crash happened in 1975. Uh, Johnny Valentine never wrestled again. Bob Brothers never wrestled again. The pilot died. Flair was in there. We had a broken back. Tim Woods was in there with a broken back. David uh, Crockett was in there. But we had a sellout at the... Uh, Stadium in Wilmington in 1975, and their plane crashed about uh, 500 feet from the runway in Wilmington. And uh, we went ahead and had the show, and uh, went over to the hospital after we saw Flair and all the guys. And like I said, Johnny Valentine and uh, Bob Brothers never, never wrestled again, but Flair might have come back, and uh, Tim Woods might have come back, and David Crockett. And, but that was one of the probably most scariest things I've ever been involved in. Professional wrestling. And one time uh, I wrestled in Memphis. Uh, Sam Bass had a couple of guys down there called the Dominoes. They had a black and half the suit was white, half was black. And they wrestled in the masses, the Dominoes. Um, one of them was Frank Hester. I can't remember the other guy's name. He was a Spanish guy. But anyway, on the way back from, uh, we wrestled that night. And on the way back from uh, Memphis, we saw them. they had a wreck. And uh, they got burned. The, the car had about 40 feet of flames up above it. And I called the police down there and blah, 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 and Jackie Fargo. And I thought that, I thought Lawler was in it, but Lawler just happened not to be in it because he did he did ride with him a lot. But got back down there and they put the car out and we had to go down and identify the bodies and everything, which you couldn't do. But that was another scary thing in wrestling I'll, I'll always remember. Uh, you guys get killed after we wrestled in Memphis. Um, you also spoke about Johnny Weaver earlier, uh, and what you thought about him. And it's my understanding he was one of your favorite wrestlers. Growing up in the, in the Mid Atlantic area, Johnny Weaver was a top wrestler forever. You know, he's great. He uh, he was a top wrestler. He worked, wrestled all the great world champions: Luthes, Jack Briscoe, Dory Funk. He's uh, he never beat any of them, but he had uh, a lot of uh, draws with them. He was probably the greatest wrestler here at that time. And that's who I'd go watch. I'd go watch him and the Scott brothers and uh, Rip Hawk, Sweet Hanson, Ole and Gene. And um, I met Johnny when I was probably about uh, 18 years old. And, uh, at that time, I met Penny Banner, his wife, too. And uh, just he knew I was a fan and we, we liked each other. And he knew I wrestled in high school and college. And then when I got into business, uh, we, we formed a really good uh, relationship. Uh, as friends, and we worked together, and we talked about the business. He taught me unbelievable stuff about professional. Johnny Weaver is an encyclopedia of professional wrestling. Probably knows as much as anybody in the business ever. Uh, and to this day, Johnny Weaver and I are really good friends, and I'm going to be seeing him next week in Charlotte. Uh, Johnny Weaver is 71 years old. He's a deputy sheriff in Mecklenburg County. He's doing real well, and uh, as you have him on some of your shows, and. Uh, you have a Johnny Weaver Cup, and I appreciate you doing that for uh, for Johnny because he deserves it and uh, he appreciates it. And I've had a lot of great times with Johnny Weaver, great man. And also, some of the things that people may not know, when you did decide to leave professional wrestling as a full-time job, uh, you, you pretty much didn't do anything for a while, but you got bored and you, NASCAR sort of caught your eye. What did you What did you do then? Yeah, I had a blood drive one time when I was a world champion uh, in wrestling. Mike Hogwood, I don't know if you remember him or not, he worked for uh, – Channel 8 Studios at that time and he later on went over to Channel 2 but he called me and wanted me to come to a blood drive in High Point and um, I just asked him, is there anybody else going to be there? And he said Jeff Bodine was going to be there. Uh, Jeff, had, I knew who he was I never had met him because I liked uh, racing a lot and uh, he was there we became friends. He loved professional wrestling and he had wrestled uh, amateur uh, when he was 10 years old in 70 pound class and he brought a little trophy and showed me. So we became buddies, and uh, like I said, I knew I was going to retire in wrestling uh, when I got 40-ish, blah, blah, blah. Uh, 
So I told him when I got when I retired, uh, I'd like to go to work for uh, Winston Cup Racing. At that time, he was driving for uh, an owner, car owner, uh, and uh, he didn't have his own team. But uh, Alan Kawicki got killed, and he bought the number 17 from Kawicki's estate. And he just only lived about 15 miles from Burlington, and we, we had became friends and everything. So um, he asked me to come to work for him as his gas man and bodyguard, and, um, and I did some sales for him, wholesales. And I also introduced him to uh, Tanya Tucker, and I did some bodyguard work for him and Tanya Tucker and a few other uh, uh, celebrities and stuff like that. So you, you, you did have an interesting after wrestling career as well, you know, oh, with NASCAR. And I also had a real estate license. I did a lot of investing in real estate and uh, stocks and bonds and stuff like that. I, I wasn't really working like a public worker or anything like that, but uh, uh, then I got to work in racing, which was great. It was, it was a lot like wrestling. You just didn't travel quite as much, but well, like we'd be in Daytona like for two weeks, having a good time and, and uh, traveling, being, you know, like we used to. Uh, so racing was good. I made a lot of money racing, had a good time. Later, when I had to, and started my own racing company, where I sold uh, uh, racing memorabilia and uh, shirts and caps and all kinds of cars and stuff like that, which turned out really good for me too. And then, and then now today, what does Sergeant Slaughter think about Sergeant Kernodle? Oh, Sergeant Slaughter thinks Sergeant Kernodle is number one. Uh, in, 19, let's see, in 2004, I went to work for uh, Sheriff Terry Johnson in Alamance County, and I'm a sergeant in the uh, detention center now. Sergeant of ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And uh, believe it or not, I really love it, and I've really uh, had a good time with it. And uh, I'm going to school next week in Charlotte for four weeks, and uh, I really enjoy the career. And, uh, my great-grandfather was sheriff here for two terms, and uh, it's something I've really grown to like, and uh, old Sergeant Canole is going to do his best to do his job. Well, uh, we got a little bit of time left, so I was going to go back and touch a few things that uh, – we may have skipped over. We skipped over one of your title reigns as World Tag Team Champion. You also held the titles with Bob Orton Jr. That's correct. And was managed by Gary Hart. Right. How about giving us a little bit of information about that? Uh, Gary Hart, I had um, I had watched also. He was here in the NWA uh, Mid Atlantic area earlier, probably in the 70s. Again, uh, he was uh, managing Rip Hawk and Sweet Hanson. So I had a hatred for him as a as a wrestling fan, but he was a great manager uh, and. Uh, had a chance, uh, we came up with an idea where Bob Orton Jr. and I uh, would be world tag team champions against uh, uh, world tag team champions and he would be our manager. Uh, and we was we was very successful uh, uh, with that venture. Uh, Bob Orton Jr. had gotten hurt and it took away from some of it, but uh, we was champions, I guess, for six or seven months. Uh, and then later, uh, Ivan, and the key and I became champions. But, uh, Bob Orton Jr. is one of the first wrestlers I ever met in the business. I met him on a plane, actually, uh, going to Tampa, Florida to do a TV show. And I had, uh, I knew his, uh, who his father was, Bob Orton Sr., and I watched as a fan. So uh, Bob Orton Jr. is a great talent in the business. Um, at that time, he was a young, uh, good guy in wrestling, and, and he was really good, uh, him and Steve Kern, and, Dennis Stamp were doing really good down in Florida, and we became friends, and we uh, we were friends for a while, and then we you know separated. We didn't see each other for a while, and uh, he's a great talent. Uh, as you know, his uh, his son is a champion of the WWE right now, but Bob Orton Jr. Uh, was a good was a good partner. Our our deal didn't it just didn't last that long. Um, that was you know due to different management too, but he's a great champion and. Um, I like Bob Orton Jr. a lot. I respect him a lot. What was uh, the, we're going to go back also to the cage match? And there's an interesting story about the cage match that we just we missed right went right past it. But um, a lot of people remember that match not only from being an incredible match, but at the conclusion of it, you leave in that ring just completely soaked in blood. I mean, you had a beard then. I mean, you couldn't even see your face. Tell us about why it was so bloody. Well, um, we had wrestled so long. Um, for a year and a half, we had a great program going, and we'd beaten Steamboat Young, but uh, all those times, and, and and they were great, great team. And I wanted to really, I wanted to really go out in style, I guess you'd say. And uh, I hated losing the belts, but it was time to do that. And uh, 
as the match progressed, uh, I don't know if I should say anything about the play on it or not. <laughs> the people would like to hear that story. It's a very interesting story. I don't know if I should or not. Well, if you don't want to talk about it, just uh, we can skip it. Did all the rest of the guys talk about stuff like that? Most oh, of them. Oh yeah. Most of them will say that will be <laughs> tame. <laughs> I'll do. Uh, getting back to the cage match with Steamboat Youngblood and, and Sergeant Slaughter and Donk, another been a feud going on for for a year and a half, and it was really went way beyond expectations. It set the foundation for great uh, things to come in the in the future, like uh, Starcade and some of the closed satellite TVs and stuff like that. And it really was a, a, a wonderful program we had, and I wanted to have a great culmination. Uh, it was time for us to drop the belts of Steam Young Youngblood. Um, and I thought we owed the fans something uh, a little extra. I thought I did anyway, because as I said, growing up in this area and was having the, uh, the championship match right there in Greensboro where I'd went all those years to watch. And, the Greensboro Coliseum and, and Madison Square Garden would be my favorite places I got to wrestle in. So uh, I wanted to really go out with a bang, I guess would be the right way to say it. Uh, uh, we had made a lot of money. We went all over the world with this thing, and, and it, was, it was fantastic. And it was just time to, to give the people their bang for the buck. And so I really wanted to go out in style, if you can say that, losing the championship. So. Uh, came time for me to get my color in uh, wrestling, um, the blood, and uh, I went to to get my blade and uh, the edge of it was broken off. So I had to use Ricky Steamboat's blade uh, and I didn't really know, uh, you know, the particulars about the way he made his blades and all like that. So when I uh, jammed that blade in my head. I had no idea what was going to happen, but uh, it was unbelievable blood came out of my head. I mean, for for 30 minutes, for 30 minutes later, it was coming out in the dress room. It was coming out. It was just, It looked like somebody had poured like a like a five gallon bucket of, of paint, red paint, on my head. Real thick blood, uh, and that was really great for me. I mean, I didn't really know it was going to happen quite like that. But it was really great for me because, as I said, uh, you had a sellout crowd. You'd done turned away 20,000 people. We had done beat Youngblood and Steamboat for a year and a half. We really, we really owed it to the fans, in my opinion, to really do a, a big, a big thing for them, have a big championship match. And uh, I wish we could have had a building that hold uh, 75,000 people. I wish we could have, could have got everybody in there and everybody could have seen it, and, and, and we could have really wish it had been on closed circuit TV. You know, looking back, you got 20 and 20 vision. But anyway, I cut myself really bad that night, and uh, or really good that night, excuse me, and uh, it bled like a son of a gun. Uh, we even, uh, in the dressing room, when they took pictures, like uh, 45 minutes later, it was still bleeding. I mean, it, it, I've never seen anything like it. I'd have to say, I've been to a lot of wrestling matches, and I, I would bet that that would be the bloodiest uh, match ever in professional wrestling, uh, before and since. And uh, went to a party that night with Ric Flair, and was all butterflied up and started laughing at him putting on a show and blood started spurting out all the people and everything but uh, that's the way it was that's professional wrestling business uh, you work hard and you want to do right for the fans too because <clears throat> if it wasn't for the fans uh, we wouldn't be here to start with so hey to lose the championship that night but I really really wanted to give the people a bang for their buck and, and let them enjoy themselves and I know they enjoyed them beating us and, that's just the way it went, and I'm, I'm happy that it happened that way. Uh, how much did Steamboat and Youngblood have uh, to do with the program that, that was with you and Sarge? Uh, Steamboat and Youngblood were hand chosen, if you will, by Sergeant Slaughter and I. When we wrote that program up, we knew it wouldn't be worth a darn if we didn't have the right people to wrestle. So when we wrote it up and presented to Jim Crockett, we asked, we asked for Jim, uh, we asked for Steamboat and Youngblood to work with. Uh, they were actually asked by us to do it. Um, they were a great team, and we were a great team, but we needed somebody good to wrestle. The business wasn't really, really hot right then. 
And so we wanted to really give it a boost and do something that never been done. So by asking for the right opponents, like I told you earlier, if you're, in a, if you're a great professional wrestler and you don't have a great opponent, you're nothing. If you're a great race car driver and you have a lousy car, you're nothing. If you have a great car and you're a lousy driver, you have nothing. So in professional wrestling, you're no better than your opponent. Uh, and as I said, a great referee is great too because they add a lot to the match. But uh, we asked for Steamboat Young Blood, and we actually ran, we actually came up with all the things for that match. I mean, for those matches, we they were working good with us. So we were friends. Uh, we had no problems working with them. They know that um, most of the time they had maybe three quarters of the match. They know they, they it was competitive. I told you, you know, and people knew at any time that Steamboat Young Blood could beat us or we could beat them. We just made it look like a, you know, boom, 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 maybe anything could happen here. We try to keep people on the edge of their seats and not let them, per se, sometimes people will look into the matches and they try to, they'll know what's going to happen or, or think they know what's going to happen. We try to keep them on the edge of their seats, do all kinds of great finishes and, and false finishes and, and, and stuff like that and keep them, keep them at bay where they didn't really know what was going on. But Steamboat Youngblood always cooperated with us. We cooperated with them. and. Uh, Everything just clicked, and we cooperated, and we had great finishes and great matches, and there's no there's no, hard, no no trouble going an hour hour time limit with them. They were they were great, and uh, anything we wanted to do, and anything they wanted to do, we cooperated with. We worked together. That's what that's what professional wrestling is is working together. Um, and it just clicked, and record breaking business, and probably never ever with Sergeant. I was just talking about the other night. Uh, probably never ever will ever be uh, twenty thousand people turned away like that with the TV coverage and all like that. It's amazing, we think now, what we could have done, say if we had us doing that now. And I give all the credit to uh, Steamboat Youngblood and Sarge because uh, they, were, they were great. And I just happened to be in there and be fortunate enough to be involved in it. Now when you talk about uh, the feud with Steamboat and Youngblood, and, and maybe tell us your thoughts about wrestling then as opposed to today. We were talking about just a little while ago during a break. Uh, how different it is cause, because you're, you're coming back to Greensboro every other week. Right. Back then, uh, we wrestled in Greensboro uh, every other week, every other Saturday night or every other Sunday night. We, uh, we had a job to go in there on TV, on the TV shows, we had a job to try to hook the people to be there on Saturday night in Greensboro. And then we had to have a great match to rehook them again to watch TV the next week, and then in the TV, rehook them again to be in Greensboro the, the, the following Saturday night. So in other words, we had to use our talent to hook them at the show, at the house shows, hook them on the TVs, and then hook them again to come back. So in other words, we was having 24 shows a year in Greensboro. Um, in other words, if you got $100,000 there tonight, two weeks from now, you want $120,000. In other words, you want them people to be back and want to say, man, we went and seen a match Saturday night against uh, Steamboat and Youngboat against Canola and Slaughter. said, man, that was the damnest thing we ever saw. Man, it was great. Well, let's go. they having a big cage match. they having a big uh, uh, battle royal or, or a over-the-top rope or any kind of match. Like a, we, we, we always liked the boot camp matches. That was one of our favorites because Sarge in the Marines. Next week they're having a next time in Greensboro, they're having a, a boot camp match. So let's go. So they'll tell all their friends and they'll go. And then you just keeps repeating and pretty soon you've got the building sold out, you know. But we had to do things that were uh, interesting, uh, believable, uh, uh, amazing. And we had to hook those people on Saturday night to get them back with whoever they could bring two weeks later. And on TV shows, we had to hook them on this Saturday so they'd try to watch it the next Saturday. It was just a, a method that it, 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 I had always, uh, that's the way it was back then. Uh, now in Greensboro, they may have four shows a year in Greensboro. They wrestle tonight and they might not be back uh, for three months. But back then, uh, it was more of a, uh, of a regional thing. Uh, we wrestled in three or four states here and we tried to tried to get the people. Not only in Greensboro we do that, we did it in, in all the towns. Richmond, Greenville, South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina. We always had to do do things, hopefully, to get the people back uh, at the next show. And we didn't have the TV coverage that they have now. So uh, we had to come up with some great uh, finishes and some great matches. And 
entertain the people. It's, it's best if you can try to send the people away happy. If you can send them away happy, and I was back then, if you can send them away happy, they'll, they'll most likely come back. But if you make them mad or they're not happy, they might not come back. So professional wrestling is psychology, man. It's the good guy, the bad guy, the white hat, the brown. It's just, it's all psychology. It's, it's amazing what you can do in it. Uh, in professional wrestling, you can be from anywhere. You can call yourself anything. You can, you can waste 8,000 pounds if you want to. You can do anything. But it's all psychology how to, to, it's a people business. In professional wrestling, you're the product and you're a salesman, you sell yourself to the people. So you're a product and you're a salesman, you sell yourself to the people and if they buy your product, they'll be there. And uh, I've got fans to the day that come up and talk to me about that match. Man, I'll never forget that match in Greensboro. I'll never forget that cage match. I'll never forget that uh, boot camp match. I'll never forget that match uh, you had with the Funks. We had a great match with the Funks, the match before that, and before the cage match in Greensboro. We wanted to have a match before that, not against Steamboat Youngblood, but against some great heels to show the people that we were tougher and we could out, out bad guy them. So it was Terry Funk and Dory Funk against Sergeant Slaughter and myself. And we had to show the people that we were tougher than them. We, we deserved to be there and we beat them. So the people said, well, God, they just beat Dory Funk and Terry Funk, two, two world champions. So they said, that, that what they would say then was, man, we need, a, we need to come to the cage match. Those canola slaughter's going to beat the crap out of them. They're going to end their career. It's going to be the last time they can wrestle together. We need to come. So we put all that stipulations in there. Sergeant Slaughter and I come up with all those stipulations. They'll never wrestle again if, they beat, if we beat them. We just beat the funds. People said, God, they're going to kill them. You know, they done beat them for a year and a half, blah, 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 blah. So we put those stipulations in there to make the people say, well, you know, we, we might ought to go over there Saturday night. Because Steamboat Youngblood, that's going to be it. They'll never get to wrestle together as a team ever again. So it's, it's all the way you do things or the way you present it, present things to the people. And uh, make it, you got to make it as believable as you can and uh, just be a good product and, and say yourself to people. Treat the people good, too, because we're, we're wrestlers and we make a lot of money. But if it wasn't for the fans, we wouldn't be nothing. NASCAR, it wasn't for the fans, wouldn't be nothing. Basketball, baseball, football, it wasn't for the fans, they wouldn't make any money, they wouldn't be anything. So I want to thank the fans, number one, for, uh, for coming out and supporting me over the years. There was one match in this research, I was young in 1983, but I remember it was on the, um, I think it was a match before y'all had the big cage match, it was the um, two referees, and y'all had a big brawl. It was one of my favorites, I only got clips of it. I was going to see if you can give your memories of that match. I think y'all just had the two referees and y'all just... Yeah. That was a, another one of the Sergeant I's ideas. We figured uh, we need to have something uh, big with Steamboat Youngblood to make it to warrant having a cage match with them. In other words, you just can't go in there and have a, no, a non-title match and say we're going to the cage match. So we had systematically stepped from a non-title match, which they won the non-title match the first time we wrestled. And then we had a, a, like a 60-minute draw, and it's a step. You just keep going. So the, the logical thing to do after that match was that was a no disqualification, anything goes match. Two referees, which are supposed to be two uh, two eyes there to watch everything, keep everything uh, under control. But uh, as you remember, it was uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a bad blood, bad bad feud, and that's what we had to do to hook the people to be there for the cage match. See, the, in fact, Sergeant and I, uh, we probably, uh, if I remember correctly, we ran out of the ring a lot, blah, blah, blah. That's the whole premise. We ran, ran, ran. But when you get in a cage, you can't run. That was the whole idea. We always got to put them in a cage, no disqualification. Somebody's going to win. Either Canola Slaughter's going to win, be the champions, or Steamboat Youngblood's going to lose and not ever wrestle again. Are they going to be the champions? Blah, 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 blah. But somebody, when, somebody had to come out of winner that night because there's no DQ. And, and it was somebody had to win. That was just all it was because they, they were in the cage. We couldn't get out. And that's the reason we had that match you're talking about because nobody could control it. We couldn't control it. They couldn't control it. Steam up, Youngblood's out of control. I was out of control. Sarge was out of control. Referee was out of control. We beat the heck out of referees. It was just mayhem. So that's the whole picture we painted to say the culmination needs to be in a cage where we, it can be controlled somewhat. 
at least you can't leave and do what you want to do. You got to stay there and fight it out to the finish. Another thing I want to say, most people when they think of a cage match, they say, well, cage. Some people say cage matches are sorry, you know, because you can't really show your talent. But the thing I like about that match y'all had with um, Steamboat and the Young Blood was y'all actually wrestled in the cage, and y'all didn't go for the cage right at the beginning. Y'all wrestled, and y'all made the cage seem like it was, you know. It was deadly when y'all finally used the cage. And that's one thing I remember about that match, being so young that I am. How y'all didn't, typically when you see a cage match, you see two guys just go in there and fight. But what y'all did, y'all actually wrestle. And that's what I loved about that whole match. You, it's a system you do in wrestling. You don't, you, you work your way up. You, you, it's, like a, it's like a story or a book. You start with a, you start with a, a good beginning, but you don't want to use your top gun. And you, and you systematically work it up. Work it up, work it up. Like you don't want to give give your finish just thirty seconds into the to the match. Way they do. Sometimes they do that now. You want to you want to build that up. You want to get those people to a, to a frenzy. They just, they just they just dying for something, man. You got to sit on the edge of your seat to this. They just foaming at the mouth wanting to see something. But you build that up. And you build that up. And you build that up. And finally, like. I was in there the whole time, you remember, a lot. Mm -hmm. And finally, there I was getting beat. Everybody thought I was going to get beat. But, boy, when I made that tap with Sarge, I said, oh, hell, you know, here he comes. It's, all hell's going to break loose now. So he came in. That's the reason we saved the Sarge as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a spectacular thing because he leads the people. In, he, leads, he leads men in the battle in the Vietnam, thousands in the battle in Vietnam, the Sarge does. He's a tough guy. He's a leader. So you don't put him in there immediately. You don't put the put – the, uh, the great thing in there to start with, you build it up, you build it up. And say Youngblood and I use them to start. Steamboat was the, was the power man on their team. Mm -hmm. So you just build it up, build it up, and you want to you want to save the best stuff for the last. You don't want to do your, your best stuff, you know. You, it, it, to be a great work in professional wrestling, it takes a long time. Some people never do it. You just learn. You, you, can, you can read those people. You can read those people. It's like you can just read their minds. You, you can know what to do. Like I can stand five feet from the rope or two feet from the rope and not even see it, I know where I'm at. I know where I'm at in that ring. I know where I'm at. I'm just, it's just a, a natural ability you get. You don't have to see it or nothing. You know where you're on the ring. You know that you know it's dangerous now. You know you got to protect yourself. Uh, but you, you build that thing up to, to, a, to a high point. Just like the book I said, you, you start off, you have a great plot. That was a great plot in that match. Um, we, were, we were using it like uh, we were smart enough not to keep them getting in the cage to start with. And then, uh, then all of a sudden, boom, somebody's in the cage bleeding now. We were, we were offensive and defensive wrestling. We were trying to keep them getting in the cage. So that shows your, your defensive wrestling ability. Uh, both, all four of us, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, it just, and then we had a great finish. Uh, like I said, we didn't get beat that night. Uh, we got screwed by, by the other team. So we really, we could say right to this day that, that they never beat us. You know, that was another that was another one of Sarge's nice. We, we had we had some pretty good ideas and come up with some good things. That way you were thirty years later, well they didn't beat us. We beat ourselves. They you should look on this tape right here. He didn't get on me, steam up put him on me, blah blah blah. But that's the way you do it. You don't go in there. If you start that off in the match, what are you gonna do later? You, you gotta save something and you gotta do you know, you just don't wanna repeat the same thing. You know, you, you gotta really Professional wrestling is a great thing. You got to really think and study that stuff. You got to read the people and what they want. Uh, I knew the people wanted to see me get a butt whipping that night. It wasn't no hard reading to do that. And so I gave them what they wanted. I knew they wanted to see me bloody and beat all the hell when I come out of that night. That's what I gave. Them. You see what I'm saying? You, you, they paid a lot of money. They've been going for months and months and months and months. They want to see me get my tail whipped. That's exactly what they saw. Bloody, tore to pieces, couldn't hardly walk, blah, blah, blah. And that's, that's the way it is. It's, it's an amazing business. But people people put it by the tights, and they get the boots, and they think they're a wrestler. That's, that's like me going to try to be a, a Ph.D. teaching school. Yeah, I could buy a race suit they're done right now, and I show up to Daytona 500 and say, what are you doing here? Are you a clown or something? It takes more to be a great professional wrestler than just buying tights and boots and saying, Here, here's the ring and everything. You gotta work on your craft and you gotta you gotta just learn it and and it's an amazing business. But but it's not just something you can just snap your finger and be a great professional wrestler. Who who would you say um, would you think, in your opinion, some of the best wrestlers that you, you got to face 
obviously Steamboat and Youngblood would be in there, but who else? Steamboat, Youngblood, Sergeant Slaughter, Flair, um, Wahoo yeah. McDaniels. Yeah, Wahoo. That's somebody else I wanted to yeah. see if you had anything. Um, I wrestled uh, Dory Funk Jr., Terry Funk, uh, golly, it just goes on. Johnny Valentine. Um, I wrestled Burn Gagne. Um, I wrestled uh, Bob Backlund. Let's see. Pedro Morales. Um, Johnny Weaver. Sweet Hanson, Rip Hawk. Um, uh, man, you could go here for days, some of the greatest ones. Uh, uh, Jack Briscoe, Jerry Briscoe, uh, what, Flair again. I mean, Flair and Steamboat and Briscoe's and all some of the greatest that ever laced up their boots. Uh, never got to wrestle Luthez. I uh, knew Luthez, one of the greatest uh, wrestlers in the business. Um, didn't know at the time one of the toughest guys in the business, Luthez. Um, it's been so many great professional wrestlers, man. You can just keep going and naming them on and on and on. Um, Ivan Koloff, Nikita. I mean, it's, it's been great wrestlers all over the world. Uh, Flair and Steamboat and Sarge are my favorites. Uh, Sarge is a big man. He could do anything. Jump off the top rope, jump off the cage. He could do things that most big men couldn't do. He's very talented, very agile, take bumps. Blah, blah, blah. You don't see that very much. He was a big guy that could do things. A lot of bodybuilders used to couldn't do, do a lot of stuff. Now you got bodybuilders who can do. Tony Atlas, one time we went down to Dillon, South Carolina. And bodybuilders, you know, he's big and, and wasn't very fluent in the ring and everything. And he, we got out at an outdoor show and they was practicing football. And he went to the football coach. He said, who's the, who's the fastest guy you got on the team? Poor black guy, about 150 pounds. He brought him over there. Like he's running back. Tony said, I want to race him. I'm going, what in the world is he doing? Tony took his shoes off and raced the fastest guy on the team. I swear he outrun him. In a 40-yard dash. Got out of the car cold and outrun him. Fastest guy on the team. Like a junior in high school. I couldn't believe it. Unbelievable. Tony Atlas was an amazing guy. Bench pressed uh, <clears throat> 625 pounds in the Omni at 19 years old. A lot of great, amazing athletes in professional wrestling. They were not only good in wrestling, but good in other, other sports too. Wahoo, he could play par golf. He was a great football player. Uh, to this day, I think he owns like a punting record or something, NCAA or something. So, a lot of great athletes in wrestling. Smart guys, some with doctor's degrees, some college education. I mean, Kurt Angle, I mean, great wrestlers. I mean, you could just keep on naming them, naming them Undertaker. You could be here forever naming great professional wrestlers. Well, do, you, do you have any stories about ribs that were pulled that you may have pulled or you may have witnessed that were memorable? Let's see, Johnny Valentine, he would glue your shoes down to the, to the, to the uh, uh, floor. He put like icy hot in your pants. Uh, Ole and Gene was bad ribbers. Uh, like I'd get stopped one time, I was driving a limo one time for Sarge and got stopped and Sarge rolled the window down and he says, officer, is my driver speeding? And he said, yes, he is. He said, well, give him a ticket to him. I said, okay, fake, okay, fake. And, you know, just stuff like that with, with cops and uh, Johnny Valentine would spit tobacco juice on you and Olin Jean with big rivers about stealing your car and stuff. I mean, they all kinds of, get your keys and go hide your car. They did a lot of kind of stuff like that. Speaking of the Anderson, this is a match that I remember was on is in the WTVS studio that I don't think a lot of people remember. It was you and Rocky against Ole and R. And it was an incredible match, and I think the match was it was no clear winner. I think y'all just had a um, I think it was like a double count out, or either they got disqualified. But I remember it was an incredible match, but no one really I don't think it got the credit that it should have got because it was a good match. It was on WTVS. Right. I, I I sort of remember that match, but man, you I had thousands and thousands of matches, but I remember doing that, but I don't remember the, the outcome of it. Uh, by the way, I heard Ole was getting married in a couple of weeks. So, who knows? Ole's health has uh, been pretty bad. He fell off the roof of his house, the rascal. And, uh, but I heard he was getting married in a couple of weeks. When you, when did you get married, Don? Oh, I'm just celebrating 30 years of divorce this month. I don't want to rush into anything too fast.
there's any rich girls out there that's interested in going out with me and marrying me, just give me a call. Well, do you have any, any other closing comments or anybody else that you want to mention? Um, I appreciate uh, you and Danny and, and your organization for having me here and High Spots. And uh, I appreciate y'all booking me in wrestling. It's fun to wrestle with you guys. You guys always treat me good. But I'd just like to, to thank all the wrestlers and all the fans and, and everybody that, uh, that made me have a wonderful career. Wouldn't take anything for it. It might not came out exactly like I, like I intended for it too, but that's life. But uh, I'd like to thank the fans and all the great wrestlers and people that I was involved with, and it was a wonderful thing. Well, thank you, Don. We appreciate it.